Hello and welcome to episode 2020 of Hazy Ripple TV. You know, when Dogfish had opened, we were just a brew pub restaurant, meaning 100% of the beer we sold uh, was in the walls of our restaurant. And then we transitioned to a production brewery that distributed and a restaurant. And then we transitioned to that plus a distillery and then another transition incorporating a hotel. You mentioned earlier that The Dead is a band that their entire march has involved all these iterations, all these transitions. Tell us a little bit about in terms of existentially the name of the band, um, the, the first major transition from the Warlocks to the dead. Tell us about that well, transition, musically the, and historically. Well, musically, as it 1965, through at the middle of 65, towards the end, they were known as the Warlocks. And as the story famously goes, they discovered there was another band playing as the Warlocks mm -hmm. that had an album out. So they kind of beat them to that. Yeah. Velvet Underground, uh, out of New York City. Was playing as, as the, Warlocks? the Warlocks? Yes. And so the Grateful Dead said, we need a new name. And as it famously goes, Jerry opened up a dictionary. Yeah. Right there, looking right at him, Grateful Dead. And they said, this is it. We both those words next Together, to Together, yeah, the story of the Grateful Dead. And so that was right there in the dictionary. And Phil said, that's the one. Everybody said, this is it. This is absolutely our perfect name. This was November, December. The first show they played was an acid test December 4th of 65 as the Grateful Dead. And musically, it was right then when they decided to start writing their own music. Really kind of mid to late 65 into early 66, as opposed to being just a cover yeah. band where you're playing five sets a night at the local pub. Yeah. Now you're writing your own music. And yeah. so that was the transition through 66. The acid test then kind of faded out in early 66. Yeah. Grateful Dead moved to Los Angeles and they thought that's where we have to go to make it. They found a benefactor, Owsley Stanley, also known as Bear, also known as the LSD guru, mm. manufacturer. So he was the band's benefactor. They moved to a house in Los Angeles, spent about three or four months there. Didn't quite make it in the LA sense, but they did rehearse all the time. Yeah. Bear gave them that flexibility. So you had the acid tests where they had this performing space where they weren't the main feature. The main mm. feature was the party. Mm. The dead were off playing or not, but mm. they were there. So that was how they kind of warm their shops on, on performing, yeah. and then Owsley let them just rehearse all the time when they moved to Los Angeles. Yeah. So they had that going for them, and then 66 is when they, I think, really became a band in terms of writing their own stuff, rehearsing all the time and taking it extremely seriously. And then, to me, when it really all clicked together, we're talking a year later when Mickey joined the band, yeah. That's the birth. And of is the that when they moved to the Bay Area? Yeah, they moved mean? back in. Uh, they moved back to the Bay Area uh, in early '66. They only spent about four months there, from yeah. winter through yeah. mid spring yeah. of '66 in LA, and then back to the Bay Area. They yeah. lived in the Hate. Yeah. It was good times for the Dead. So the Hate, and then you've got as you were, you know, we were talking earlier about the Beats, yeah. and so that's exactly the time. Yeah. So this hotel that we're in in Lewis used to be called the Vesuvio, and Mariah and I were out visiting the Bay Area and went to the famous Vesuvio Bar, which is right near City Lights. Uh, bookstore, which is kind of the ground zero of the beat movement. Mm -hmm. The first publishers of uh, Ginsburg's Howl was Ferlinghetti. Ferlinghetti actually and his team at City Lights curated mm -hmm. our, our, our hotel's uh, library. We got his signature on the mm -hmm. wall uh, next to there. And there's actually been lots of overlaps uh, between the, the, the beat movement and the dead in terms of, you know, the inspiration being a lot of intuitive uh, in the moment uh, adjustments, sort of an organic growth of the fan base. Mm -hmm. What similarities would you say exist between the beat movement and the Grateful Dead? Well, we, in the recent Grateful Dead documentary, The Long Strange Trip, they talk about, I think it was Alan Triss talking about the, the early deadheads, the hippies, being uh, the, the, the beats being the proto hippies, and then they were kind of thinkers. And that's mm. where it comes from, is thinkers and thinking outside the box. And they really didn't fit into mainstream culture, yeah. just as the hippies didn't, and just as deadheads don't. And that's one thing that deadheads, I think, always have prided ourselves on, is that we're a bit of misfits, we're off-centered. Yeah. You know, it's, and that's kind of, you know, that brings us into why Dogfish Head was the perfect fit for the Grateful right. Dead to partner with. And that's kind of how deadheads always saw themselves, just as the beats did too. They didn't necessarily at all fit into mainstream culture, right. Ferlinghetti and right. that whole crew of City Lights, that's not right. mainstream. They were doing, you know, poetry slams and readings in the Vesuvio bar before they were being referenced on the front page of the New York Times. And similarly, if you think of, you know, our, our, our journey as a brand and how inspiring Grateful Dead is to, to Dogfish Head, right in this yard, 
at our little hotel on the weekends, there's always bottle swaps mm -hmm. where beer lovers from around the country come and stay here and they trade their favorite mm -hmm. stuff. And that's kind of how the word about Dogfish Head got out, you know, was through our fan base, helping to evangelize for what makes us special with other beer lovers. And certainly you were very early in the taping tradition, even before you were overseeing the whole legacy of the dead and an archivist. Maybe talk about maybe that, how the band's reputation grew out of that taping phenomena. So it was really a grassroots, you know, consumer driven movement more so than uh, a commercial driven movement. Absolutely. And, and when I wasn't, I was 16 years old, I started seeing the dead and a couple of years before that, I started trading tapes, never for sale. It was exactly like the beer trades you talk about at the fire. And we would, you tell me that you had these 10 great shows and I don't have those 10, but I've got these 10 you don't have. We make copies. I've got two tape decks. You make me all of a sudden my tape collection has gone from 10 to 20. And before you know it, you've got a thousand tapes. And when you're not going to shows, what you're doing is trading tapes. And it was a huge part of our identity. And mm -hmm. that's really, you know, the dead. I don't know what Dogfish is um, 25 years ago with the overall uh, growth projection was. Yeah. Or if, if everything happened organically, I always feel within the dead world, everything happened organically. It's yeah. just growth happens. Yeah. And that's why you go from this step to that to that. Yeah. And that's what kept happening with the Grateful Dead. And it seems like they were just so focused as a band on making sure the people that love them had the ultimate best experience, uh, whether it was the investment in the wall of sound, the amazing you know acoustics that they invested they, they in, they cared ahead of their time. Yep, to a decision that frankly would be seen as anti-commercial by most folks of allowing their music to spread and like for open source. Right? And the record companies couldn't stand that. Arista and prior to that, Warner Brothers, like yeah. you guys are nuts to do that. Yeah. You can't let people tape your music. They're not going to buy the records. And the Dead's answer was first of all, we'll help promote those records. But second of all, our records aren't that good anyway. Let them have the live <laughs> shows, which is where we excel. We want this fan base to grow. We want them to hear us at our best. Yep. And that's not our records, yeah. which I disagree. I think there's some great records, but they're right. The live shows are where it's at. So yeah. they let the fans have it. Yeah. It was a pretty unique way of doing it. In our industry, it's very similar in that the majority of the 8,000 breweries across America don't distribute through distributors and retail mm -hmm. stores. Customers come right to their breweries. We're going to go to our brew pub in Rehoboth tonight where customers go directly mm -hmm. there, buy the beer directly from us. Now that may be our distributor in Delaware is like, ah, it's kind of frustrating. Yeah. We're not getting a piece of that pie because it's going right between the customer and the brewery. But our distributors know that if people come to the source and fall in love with it, then they'll go off in the world, tell other people about it, and then people will buy our beer in distribution. Exactly. So I want to go back to something uh, which would be, um, you know, we have, um, you know, core beers that I would call like our recorded, uh, our, you know, our, our official release. Yes. Like the way there's official, not live. And then we do all these one-offs and art series and occasionals that I would say are more like the live mm -hmm. performance performance world. Um, when you're, when you're, when first of all, I want to know when you said you feel that everyone always thinks of the dead as oh that's a band that's best their live recordings mm -hmm. not their their studio albums what would what would you say are the top three and i know it's a subjective answer but top three recording albums from different eras for you of the dead for the dead studio uh, albums. i would say working man's dead and american beauty I, I get asked that a lot those albums like we say came out five months apart mm. and they're very similar they're acoustic dead they're very much what the dead were doing in 70 the vocal harmonies I have a tough time separating them as which is my favorite, yeah. and, and it's very subjective. Yeah. But I'm going to uh, give you that as one of the three. Then, then that's I, I thank you. Um, <laughs> and then uh, I, I really enjoy Terrapin Station. I like that one a lot. That was late seven. Uh, 1977. Yeah. Yep, I really love that one. And then in the mid 70s, the Dead had three records on their own record label. They left Warner Brothers, but they hadn't signed. They had about five years before they signed with Arista, and they put out. Wake of the Flood and Mars Hotel and Blues for Allah. And mm. all three of those, again, I have a soft spot for Wake of the Flood. It was one mm. of those albums that when I was 16, I listened to all the time and it mm. meant a lot to me at 16. So it stuck with me now 35 years later. Yeah. So Wake of the Flood, I really love and Terrapin Station. Um, to me, there's something to be said for all yeah. of them. And, and you get to In the Dark, you get to the Touch of Grey album in yeah. 1987. I love that album too. Yep. Yeah. Mine is, um, uh, and I fell in love with it for the, I saw it in the window and loved the cover of it. That's how I discovered the dead, which was Shakedown. Oh, Street. nice, good one. Is it? Yeah, I mean, yep. it's more of a disco. -y. Yep, it's an outlier of sorts, right? Yes, yes, they had uh, some influences for sure. <laughs> yep, that's a good one. Yeah, I do like Shakedown Street a lot. Nice. I put on the studio records a lot more than 
I think people think I do. Yeah. And uh, you know, I play a lot of records at home and a lot of Live Dead, the bulk of what I do with Live Dead. I don't have a lot of time to just put Dead on when yeah. it's not work related, but I yeah. put on Shakedown quite a bit. Yeah, nice. Like that nice. one. At Dogfish, we, we have a, a saying that we believe a lot more in, in the good energy that comes with focusing on collaboration instead of the negative energy that surrounds focusing on competition. And yes. there's thousands of bands out there, there's thousands of breweries. We choose to find the ones that we love that have complementary superpowers to ours and celebrate them. And the Dead have an amazing history of that in terms of bands that they've covered, bands that they've toured with. Uh, what are some of your favorite Grateful Dead collaborations, other than uh, present company excluded here. But but what are, give me a few musical collabs that really ring your bell. You know, I I really like the Dead played with a lot of people over the years, and sometimes it worked. And the problem with playing with the Grateful Dead, I find, no matter how talented the musician might be, when you sit in, you're sitting in on an inside joke that has been going for five years or 20 years or however long when this person sat in, and, and it's tough to fit in. Everyone else in the band is, is pretty much in telepathy. Exactly that, it's exactly. So the dead have to often yeah. cool it down when that happens, not always though. So 1970, at the Fillmore East, they had uh, Dwayne and Greg Allman come out and play with them and a few of the Fleetwood Mac was guys. Was that pre the famous Allman Live album or right after? It would that? have been right before that. Okay. Yep, it would have been 70. And the, so the Almonds were on the bill and they played incredible sets, but they came out and jammed with them in the third, the second set, the late show um, at one of the nights. And that is a collaboration that really, really worked. Yeah. Allman came back twice. Yep. And the Dead agreed that was one of the greatest collaborators they'd ever had in the studio. It certainly was. And then even after Dwayne was gone from this earth, uh, in 73, they collaborated a bit more at a couple of other shows, Watkins yeah. Glen, yeah. places like that. That's so. cool. Well, I'd say this is one of my favorite collaborations Dogfish Head's ever done. Are you as happy with Hazy Ripples as we are? Yet? Yes, and again, I, I mentioned this last year, I'm not a uh, beer connoisseur, but I know what I like, yes. and I really like this a All lot. Right. Thank you, Dave. <laughs>